just going to start with a brief introduction to BIVDA. So BIVDA is the national British In Vitro Diagnostics Association. So we are the National Trade Association for the In Vitro Diagnostics Industry. Um, as an organisation, we currently have around 120 member companies and about 30 associate members. So the companies range in size from just small startup companies who have yet to launch a product and then go right the way through to uh, UK subsidiaries of multinational organisations plus everything in between basically. Um, in terms of product range, they sort of start with companies selling such things as simple lateral flow tests for pregnancy tests and then right through molecular diagnostics and next gen sequencing. Um, so the UK uh, IVD industry it currently represents about 8,000 employees, and those people are in roles such as manufacturing roles, R&D, product support, engineering, as well as more traditional sales and marketing that you people probably see. In 2014, direct UK sales of IVD products was in the region of £730 million, um, and for this spend, there were around 900 million tests performed. Whoops. Um, okay, so BIVDA is an organisation we recognise that AMR is a global problem that requires collaborative work with pharma, genetics and biosciences sectors. And as an organisation, we have close links with the, our equivalent organisations across the sectors. We also have a working party consisting of member companies who are active in the AMR area and they meet on a regular basis to discuss any topical issues. And I would suggest if anybody's wanting to interact with industry, that's a useful place to start. As an organisation, we're a signatory to the Declaration of Conformity, which was announced in Davos earlier this year, and we also encourage all of our member companies to sign up to that. Um, as an organisation, we're quite excited about the growing recognition of the role of IVDs in tackling AMR. Historically, diagnostics really been a bit the poor cousin. We've always received a lot less attention than the drugs, the pharmaceutical industry. So it's nice that there's so much going on within the, our sector nowadays. You can see that the, without diagnostics, really medicine is blind. So there can be a lot of investment in new antibiotics, etc. But unless you know which patients you're going to use them on, then it's very difficult to make good use of them. It's estimated that about 70% of all clinical decisions are based on IVD tests. And when looking at specifically at the area of AMR, diagnostics can do a lot to guide the best use of antimicrobials. As misuse of antibiotics is one of the main drivers of AMR, anything which can help with that has to be of some value. There have been quite a number of initiatives over the last three years which are helping to thrust IVDs into the spotlight. The first one of these was the UK five-year AMR strategy, which was published in 2013. And this recognised that the use of rapid diagnostics to enable both appropriate treatment and surveillance was recognised as being key to addressing some of the issues, as was the development of new diagnostics, which is something I'll come back to. There is a diagnostic subgroup which is actively looking at how the strategy can be implemented and Biv directively participates in this work. More recently, there's been the O'Neill Review on Antimicrobial Resistance, which was published in May this year with the final report. Diagnostics was recognised to be a key element in this and there was a separate diagnostics report was published in October last year. One of the recommendations in the final report, which we're very happy to see, was for the uptake and use of rapid point-of-care diagnostics in both primary and secondary care to be supported, with incentives to be considered to facilitate the man mandatory use of such tests to support clinical decision-making where available. From an industry perspective, of course this sounds fantastic to say manda mandating use of tests, but in reality it's not so easy partly due to a lack of consensus about what should be considered to be sufficient evidence. At the moment, IVDs go through, can go through a nice assessment process. It's not compulsory, unlike pharma, and the assessment process can take up to two years. At the end of that time, guidelines are produced, but they are only guidelines. And unlike pharma, even if there are positive guidelines, there is no funding attached to them. Technology is changing so rapidly nowadays that a test could be out of date by the time it's gone through that process. There are new IVD regulations coming into force 
uh, should be later this year, possibly early next year, and that should help go some way to address the issue. There is, will be a greater requirement for clinical evidence. However, there still needs to be some agreement about just what, how much evidence is sufficient for products to be adopted in the UK market. Another boost for IVDs came with the launch of the Longitude Prize in November 2014. Uh, there's more information out on our stand up there if anybody's interested. There was a decision to focus on an IVD which would have an impact on our, I, sorry, AMRs was the result of a public vote. So it really was a welcome surprise that this was of so interest to so many people. Particularly if you look at the other areas that, which were up for, um, which were an option such as dementia and clean, clean water. The prize is the UK's biggest science prize with a 10 million pound prize pot to be won. And the aim of the prize is to, to encourage the development and commercialization of a rapid point of care test which will be transformative and have a significant impact on the use of antibiotics. So what the organizers are looking for is a real game changer rather than just something that's a slight improvement on current technology. The impact has to be global and there's no area, disease area specified at the moment, so it's just a very broad scope. So far, there's been 200, over 200 teams registering interest from 37 different countries, and 19 teams have actually made submitted entries yet, but there's still no winner as yet. The teams have been quite an interesting mix, not all of them from a traditional diagnostic background, which is what the organizers were hoping to see. So it's going to be interesting to see what the final winning test is going to look like. Although there sometimes seems to be a perception that there'll be one, one test or technology which will be the perfect diagnostic, the actual role of a, of a IVD can be quite different depending on what stage of the patient care pathway it's being used. And therefore, the specifications of the test will also need to be quite different. For example, the test that's going to be used in a GP surgery, something like time, speed of test, ease of use of the test may be more important than the sensitivity as long as the test does actually do what's required of it. There was a workshop run by the Wellcome Trust last year and they, out of this they identified four clearly defined roles for IVDs, all of which had quite different questions which needed to be answered for the test to be adopted. So the different roles were avoiding unnecessary antibiotic use, optimizing patient treatment and antibiotic use, identifying high-risk patients, and improving drug development and stewardship. So we really need better understanding about which tests should be undertaken where and why. So I'll just go through those in a bit more detail. So one of the key areas where there's a, a role for a rapid point-of-care diagnostic is at a GP surgery to confirm whether a patient has a bacteria or a virus, i.e. Bag, no bug, no drug. There are a number of reports where GPs have said that they feel under pressure to prescribe an antibiotic just so the patient will go away, essentially. It seems that having access to a simple test would help with that pressure. There was a recent report in the Telegraph a couple of weeks ago about a new genetic test, which has just been discovered, two genes which are only switched on when a child is suffering from bacterial infection, which would answer that question about bacteria or virus. And that may well lead to a new blood test at some stage in the future. But in the meantime, there is a test already out there, has been available on the UK market for some time, but with varying levels of adoption as a point of care test within primary care. And that's of course CRP, C-reactive protein. There's been a lot of work done with this test, and you can see there, there's a map showing the different, the association in countries where there's a lower use of antibiotics and associated with, potentially, some association with the use of CRP test. Netherlands in particular, there's been a significant reduction in the use of antibiotics. However, use within a point of care setting within the UK is still very patchy. Number of, there are a number of reasons for this and possibly lack of funding would be an obvious one. But there also seems to be an apparent reluctance to accept what evidence is available. There's currently, I believe there's been up to 15 different studies carried out across England separate studies looking at the use of this, and there's a further 10 being planned that I'm aware of. And this is something which really need to be addressed if the recommendations around mandating the use of tests is to be implemented. 
The next clear role for IVDs is in optimising treatment, i.e. what's causing the infection, what antibiotic would be effective, or can a more targeted antibiotic be used? Some tests to answer these questions are already widely available and in use within the secondary care setting, and technology advances have meant a great improvement in the speed of results. Traditional culture is still used in a lot of cases, but real-time PCR, for example, has meant that an organism such as TB can now be identified directly from a sputum sample, along with information about its resistance to rifampicin. Another piece of um, automation, the Moldytoff, it's another example of new technology which can be used to provide rapid information about what organism is responsible, informing decisions about therapy options. Diagnostics can also be used to identify high-risk patients, for example, by using biomarkers as prognostic markers, and procalcitonin is something which has been used to demonstrate this. It was originally developed as a test for differentiating between infectious and non-infectious causes, but there's been some recent work looking at the use of procalcitonin values and a fall in values when monitoring critically ill patients with sepsis, and it appears that there is some evidence that a, a fall is associated with, with the favourable outcome. So this is something that there's future poten potential for future growth. IBDs can also be used in helping recruit patients into drug trials and thereby in increasing, the in increasing the speed of market of new treatments. Clearly, as yet, nobody has yet developed the holy grail of IVD tests, that five-minute test that's going to be able to determine if the infection is indeed bacterial, identify the organism, and provide a sensitivity profile, all at an affordable price. However, looking at the different ways and settings in which a test will be used, and identifying the high-priority disease areas will certainly help guide industry in their development work although more discussion is probably needed to, term, to specify exactly how and where a test will be of most value. There's certainly some exciting developments already underway. So finally, I'll just leave you with a parting message on behalf of industry. There are tests in development, but in the meantime, I would ask you to please use the tests which are already available and which have been shown to work. There's a lot of discussion about how to engage, encourage industry to invest more in R&D, and I would suggest that adoption of existing tests would certainly send a strong positive message. I'd also urge all of you to become proactive in the adoption of these new tests as they start to appear on the market. Be willing to evaluate them and don't wait until there's years of scientific publications before you adopt them if they have been shown to be a significant improvement over current procedures. And last but not least, ensure that where possible, any decisions regarding the use of antibiotics are backed by diagnostic evidence. Correct identification of the infection improves antibiotic stewardship, so let's conserve or do whatever we can to help with that. And thank you for your time. Thank you,